Hit the subscribe button or visit us at auau.auanet.org. Welcome to Advancing Women in Urology, Negotiating for Success Live course. We're excited to have you all with us and look forward to an exciting discussion with the faculty. Before we get started, we have a few housekeeping notes to review. Evaluations are very important to us. Course evaluations will be administered electronically on AUA University immediately following the activity. As the AUA continues to develop virtual, virtual education that meets your needs, we welcome your feedback regarding both the content and format of this activity. Upon completion of course, act, course evaluations, you will have the opportunity to obtain a certificate of participation. We hope you will act actively participate as you connect and learn from each other during the course. Due to the size of the audience, all participants will be in listen only mode without video, but we encourage you to ask questions at any time through the chat box. Questions will be addressed at the end of the panel discussion. This educational series was made possible by support from Eurovan. Finally, it's my pleasure to introduce and extend a special thank you to our course director, Dr. Nancy Spector, for her time, talent, and expertise developing this program. Dr. Spector is a professor of pediatrics and serves at the Drexel University College of Medicine as executive director of the Executive Leadership in Academic Medicine, a national leadership fellowship program for women in academic medicine dentistry, health, and pharmacy, and as executive director of the executive leadership in the healthcare program for women, leaders in, the, leaders in hospital and healthcare systems. Dr. Spector is known for her, her leadership abilities and facilitation skills, her contributions to the graduate medical education and academic medicine are in leadership skills development, professional development, gender equity, mentoring and sponsorship, and curriculum development and implementation. I will now turn the activity over to Dr. Spector. Hello, it's, it's really wonderful to be here to facilitate this session. It's really exciting. Um, the goal of this initiative is really to uh, facilitate the advancement of strategic career printing planning for everybody in this field. And it is a, a sort of collaboration between the leaders in AUA, as well as other allies across other disciplines to support this effort. And I'm really excited to be here um, to support also this effort. Um, this topic was based on feedback from the AUA needs assessment uh, survey that was completed by the women-led steering committee of this group. Um, including Dr. Simone Thavaseelan, who is here with us tonight, and I'm really excited to introduce her in a few minutes. Our learning objectives for today are to really um, create a framework for thinking about the importance of negotiation and thinking about it strategically from the viewpoint of an individual as well as the institutions that were involved, because in negotiation is really important. Um, we need to um, use this as a tool of critical to, to move things forward in our as individuals and organizations. And we have to think about the impact that negotiation has uh, for our personal advancement as well as the advancement of our efforts and organizations to move diversity, equity, and inclusion going forward. Next slide. So with that, I am so incredibly honored to introduce our incredible panel. Um, I'm really lucky to um, really have had the experience of partnering with many of the people in this group for many years on many different aspects of um, helping women to advance in their careers. Uh, we have some incredible people here. Um, we decided, by the way, to uh, 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 
introduce ourselves by our formal names, not our first name. So I will introduce first Dr. Julie Freischleg, who has been a great colleague, a great partner with ELAM, Executive Leadership in uh, Academic Medicine for many years. I can't speak more highly of her in her as being a champion of women in every aspect of academic medicine, and in particular for advancing women in surgery and the disciplines that um, accompany general surgery, all the surgery subspecialties. I've heard nothing but amazing things from her mentees and I've had nothing but amazing experiences with her. She currently is the chief executive officer of Atrium Health Wake Forest Baptist and, and just recently um, was the dean of Wake Forest and has really excitedly appointed another woman as dean um, in her role uh, to replace her and has a uh, long track record of supporting women into high level leadership positions. She is the ultimate, in my mind, role model for us as women um, in supporting women, sponsoring women, advancing our, our diversity efforts across our field. Next, we have Dr. Kim Templeton, who I also have to say is an amazing champion. Um, she is from the field of orthopedic surgery, so a field where there are very few women leaders. She is currently the vice chair of orthopedic surgery um, and uh, has many other leadership roles at the University of Kansas Medical Center and has a dean's role there. And I have to say, um, I have been really in awe of her as she has championed uh, supporting women from medical school on through the pathway to advancement into thinking about careers in orthopedic surgery and other surgery sub subspecialties, as well as how to advance into academic medicine. And then newest into my um, professional sphere is Dr. Simone um, Thavasalan, who is uh, a core to this group, who has been a champion for all the efforts here. She's an associate professor of surgery um, at Brown University and has leadership positions, not only in the medical school, but at Rhode Island Hospital, in many, many of the um, specialty organizations that are associated with your field. Her bio is really impressive. I've been so impressed by her depth of knowledge of the issues that are affecting the field of your field and I'm really excited to be here to introduce her. Good evening, everyone. I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you, Dr. Spector. Um, I'm going to provide a brief overview on the needs assessment that Dr. Spector referenced. Back in the spring of 2022, the AUA, AUA developed a steering committee comprised of 10 women urologists at various stages of their career, of which I was a member. The steering committee was established to, in order to help the AUA develop uh, a platform for women in urology to elevate awareness and provide content that focuses on career tips, career advancement, and education for women. And part of the steering committee's role was to provide oversight and expertise into the development of a needs assessment survey that the AUA administered online in August of 2022. This was sent to over 3,000 women urologists in the U.S. and around 450 responded for a response rate around 15 percent. And the needs assessment survey results helped identify current needs and gaps for education and training of women in urology. It also helped identify areas of needs specific to those who are in early career and mid-career, as well as those who are advanced practice providers. The results from the survey indicate that top areas of need overall are negotiation and self-advocacy, mentorship and sponsorship, and communication. And as a result, uh, we're excited to offer today's uh, live webinars, a series of three webinars and new podcasts on AUA University that focus on these topics, including mentorship, sponsorship, and coaching and self-advocacy. We hope today's discussion with myself and these esteemed colleagues in our parallel surgical subspecialty fields uh, will offer new insight and tangible strategies that we can all apply uh, and be used in our everyday, both big and little negotiations.
So if I could ask our panelists to join us. I have a question, our first question. I'm gonna start with Dr. Templeton. Why is it important for us as women to negotiate? I think it's, and I'm, I'm thrilled that the AUA has taken on this, this topic because it's extremely important. I think it's it's important, especially as women, because we're not always brought up to to negotiate. I think it's getting better, but at least in in my generation and those before that, <clears throat> girls were brought up to just do things for the better good of the family, whereas boys, I think, understood that they what they did was worth something and it was negotiable. And I think we really need to get away from that frame of reference and and work with women to understand that their knowledge and their talents are important and, and it's worth negotiating for. So it's to make, it's negotiation for women is critical if we're going to uh, maximize our potential in medicine, if we're going to continue to rise through leadership positions and get more women into those leadership positions. And it's also to remember that, to remember that everything is negotiable. So it's not just salary and support, but everything that we work with is negotiable. And by negotiating and getting what you need to do or to, to do your job and to succeed in a leadership position, yet you really need to negotiate for everything that's needed. And that's gonna show people that we can succeed as leaders. You don't wanna be in a position where you don't have what you need to succeed because that's going to be a significant hindrance on your career. But also it's, it's important to negotiate so that you get those positions for which you're qualified and it helps people understand what you as a woman physician can do, can understand what it is that you bring to the table, but you can bring a lot of things to the table. And if you don't negotiate for what you need to succeed, then it's not going to matter. So it's negotiating to get what you need to be successful in your career, not only for your own future career success, but for all the women coming up behind you. Thank you so much, Dr. Tavisilin. The same question. Sure. You know, I'll start with a personal disclosure and say, I think of myself as a student and not an expert in negotiation. And I am constantly practicing. And I think negotiation is people moving as much as it is problem solving. And I think people are messy. And the practice of negotiation is messy. And I think sometimes it looks like failure. And I think the underlying feeling there is this fear or discomfort with negotiation, because I think, um, you know, it feels like risk taking. Um, and I think in from a socialization point of view, we're, we're socialized to minimize risk taking. But um, apart from that gender specific difference, I think you have this sense of risking the perception of being greedy or pushy or aggressive or assertive in attempting to negotiate. And I think for myself, I really have to reframe my mindset on this and think about and focus on the value, you know, by virtue of that decade long of training um, and my skills and experience that might bring to a situation or a service line or a program. Um, and I think, you know, the mantra is I'm worth it in your head um, because you look on paper to be worth it. But yet in those events, when you're trying to, to sell yourself, uh, you know, you, you can forget how incredible you are. Um, and I think also in the big picture, you know, the disparities for, that women face in urology and certainly in medicine in terms of initial salary offer, lifetime compensation, access to soft resources, um, they all compound over time and they all impact our, our success, our sustainability and the impact that the talented women in urology have, uh, you know, to offer the field. So I, I think clearly it's important. It, it's just tricky um, in my experience. Thank you. And Dr. Freshlight, if you could add from a personal perspective why it's important, but also from a institutional standpoint, what is the value to the institution? Sure. And I so identify with what she just said, because my first negotiation for my first job was to ask the two partners how much money they made. Uh, and so that I would get that amount. And, and, and guys will tell you, you asked a guy how much money he makes, he'll tell you, you know, he'll, and so part of that was my negotiation was to hit in that ballpark, but I didn't think about the other things I needed, um, certainly call schedules and access to patients and that, the looking at my research portfolio, I didn't really think about that as much. As a leader, I expect you to come in with requests. We call them terms, you know, what, what you're going to do, especially if it's a leadership position, if it's a, a partnership position, say joining a group or whatever, there's many things you need to negotiate as far as, you know, call schedule and, access to patients. I know we've seen that in many 
women surgeons that they join groups where they're not in a position that they get the best referrals. So coming up with a way that you're the doctor of the week, so you get all those referrals. Or we've seen that women in Kaiser or other um, institutions where people take regular call and it's not a preferential piece, they tend to get equal referrals for tough cases, interesting cases, where in some academic arenas, like in my field of vascular surgery, women will get more venous referrals versus arterial, and maybe not aortic versus other types of referrals. So looking at how you're going to get your patients, how you're going to get paid, who are your partners, and who's your boss, I think is really important to do that. And then if you're looking at leadership positions, you need to ask a lot of questions about the people you're going to lead. You know, what do they need? Because you're going to be not negotiating just for you, you're going to be negotiating for what your team, whether it's a division or a department, and when I was a department chair at Hopkins for 11 years, I spent a, a few weeks actually talking to all the division chiefs, to the administrator, figuring out what did everybody need as I put into my package. So being inquisitive, uh, being uh, questioning. And as a leader, I expect you not to take the deal, that you would have opportunity, first looking at how to be successful. And I would probably save your personal things, such as salary or whatever. Most of us are offering appropriate salaries these days because we use many different institutions or uh, services to do that. But getting the job you want and then getting the salary you want is probably second. Thank you so much. And you started to drill down into this question, um, but what else should we think about negotiating for? Um, and I think we're, we're thinking about new positions and new opportunities, but you could expand um, this idea. Dr. Uh, Thavis Salen, uh, like what should we be, be negotiating for? Not only when we're transitioning into a new job, but at our annual performance reviews or our check-ins with our leaders. Yeah, you know, I think the list is long and that first uh, top line list to, and the obvious is salary. But then when you move on from that, you're thinking about paid time off. You're thinking about parental leave. You're thinking about RVU accommodations for lactation time uh, during the transition for parental leave and back to work. You're thinking about CME time, CME funding. Um, you're thinking about soft resources that, you know, might not come up like OR block time and who controls that? Who is your scheduler? We all know that the front desk that runs the machine of the system, the wheels can be greased in one direction or another. And so office space, office staff, computers, do you get a nurse? Do you get an MA? Who are you sharing that with? What level of experience do they have? Um, to say nothing of OR equipment, uh, scribes, chart prep. Um, and then I think in terms of benefits, you know, you're kind of used to the standard package of health insurance, disability, life insurance. Um, and I think the other things that strike me are the issue of retirement, um, moving expenses, um, signing bonuses, loan forgiveness, uh, tuition reimbursement. If you're thinking about maybe another degree to build your leadership, uh, you know, CV down the line, um, all worth asking for, or at least bringing up and having a discussion about. The worst they say is no, but you, you're on the radar asking. And then I think a few other things, you know, in, in transition, we speak about non-competes. If things don't work out, wh where is your next move and landing site, kind of termination notices? What's the entry point to partnership? Uh, what does that highway look like to get on and maybe even get off um, or stepping stones? So I think there's a lot to be negotiated for in addition to that salary uh, piece of it. Wow, that's quite a list and impressive. And I'm going to ask a follow-up question maybe in a minute, maybe to Dr. Templeton and Dr. Freshleck. How can you figure out like what is that list? Where where is it? And who's going to help you figure out what you should be asking for? I think that entire list you write down on one piece of paper and you kind of start to think about your own answers to it, then you're tapping your mentors or anyone who's recently been hired there um, or any inside, you know, players that you have because you're, you're looking for those allies to give you access to information uh, that allows you to have greater influence. And I think I think a lot about uh, informal power and soft the soft power of influence in general in my day to day and my leadership roles and how to 
get more access to information that might not necessarily be intended for me because I mean I think that's where the game is being played in some sense and so um, I think this is also kind of critical where male allies can potentially come up you know the most likely last hire is going to be one of our male colleagues in neurology and so trying to reach them to get a, a bit of information on what their deal was. I think we also like understand this idea of national benchmarks for salary, MGMA, whatever they are, and that they exist, and that we're looking to see if we're kind of fair value market compared to that. And I think that makes a lot of reasonable sense. And I think most people who are in business are, are probably going to come up with an area, a ballpark that makes sense, but it's all the other little perks that, you know, that are being negotiated on the side if others are asking about it that you may not ask and things like RVU accommodation I think is is one of those like you you're, you're planning probably some sort of parental leave and how's that going to affect you how can you you know prevent it from worsening your your outcome uh, or at least maintaining stability. Dr. Templeton how would you add to that? <clears throat> I think those are all great points. And I guess what I always tell people is that people said, everything is everything. negotiable. So anything that you want to th think far beyond salaries, Dr. Thalassian just mentioned. Um, but I think it's also important to ask about things such as potential leadership roles. Will you get the necessary mentorship and sponsorship to achieve those? Because although you're looking at MGMA benchmarks, there are also some leadership positions or medical directorships that are also compensated. So when you look at the compensation that your male colleagues are receiving, you may only be seeing what the, the salary is for their position, not all of the other positions that they may hold that can be compensated. And I think that's where women tend to have some issues when we're looking solely at income is that it's not just what you're getting paid for your day job, but what you're getting paid for all of the leadership positions that you may hold, which as we know are primarily held by men. So I think during the negotiation, it's finding out what all of the other things are that the men may have access to, what the potential leadership opportunities are, or is there compensation for those? Will you receive the necessary mentorship and sponsorship to achieve those? Are, are they open to having women in those positions? And as you go along that path, what are the opportunities for coaching? Will your department also help pay for coaching that you would need to progress up the career path? Wonderful. And Dr. Freischleg, how would you add to that? Yeah, those are really great points. You know, so I came out of training in the 80s. Uh, so my first job, I had no block time for two years. So I did all my operations between 3 p.m. and midnight. That's just what it was. It was a tough thing. That's what you did. I got to know the trauma surgeons really well because that's when I did my cases. I remember doing one case with an abdominal aortic aneurysm and the intern came in to help me. And I was like, where's the chief president? Well, he was helping a very senior surgeon do a hernia. So I had to walk into his room and said, uh, Dr. So-and-so, I, I know you're doing this hernia. I'm doing an open AAA. I, I think I want to have the chief resident. He basically said, you can have him when we're done. Uh, and so it was a whole <laughs> different world, right, to do it. Um, then my second job, when I, I took it, I, I had a, a baby, uh, and, and it was interesting because I did get great maternity leave. I worked for the VA at that time. They paid my salary while I was gone, which was great. I did lose bonus money because I wasn't operating for those 11 weeks, um, and I wasn't in vitro mom, so there were a lot of complications, but the day I got back, my partner put me on for 16 days out of the next 30 to pay back the call <laughs> and, and he had had a baby too but it was his wife uh, so I, I actually went to him I said I'll pay you back but I can't do it this month he's only four months old you know to make that happen and he was a little brain dead so part we've come a long way from that where you had but I was only the only woman on faculty at my first two jobs and only one of two women on my third job so I think we have gotten policies and put them in I know as a dean as in we have maternity policies. We did not have them at Wake when I showed up. We did not have them at Hopkins when I showed up. So having those opportunities there so you can take care of you and your family is, is really important. But I, I do think when you look at where salaries have a disparity is just what Dr. Templeton said. It's where men will negotiate, you know, 15, 30, $50,000 to do a, a leadership position 
they'll actually put themselves in spaces where they can support themselves off the grid of RVUs. And now that we're really hitting really struggles with margins and trying to figure out how to make ends meet, those kind of things are really important. The thing I'll tell you though, as you go looking for those, make sure you want to do it. Because part of it is you want to make sure you get a leadership position you enjoy, whether it's teaching or research or administration. And maybe it's a stepping stone to the next thing you want to do. And that's why it's so important when you come to a new institution is to ask for some allies, some sponsors, a team. I know with our new chairs, we give them a team of chairs to help them do that uh, so that they actually get to know the culture as quick as possible so they can be successful. And I'll tell you, if you really want me to give you everything you want at the end of all your negotiation where you ask for your time off and making sure you have block time and that you've got adequate access to patients and all that, if you look at me and say, so Dr. Freischlag, there must be one or two things you'd like me to do for you. If you say that to me, oh my God, you're in. I always have a whole list <laughs> to do that. So if you do one or two for me that I actually can either pay you for, reward you, or I only ask, I actually tell my people, I only ask you to do important things, not things that aren't going to make you strive. If you do that, one, I'll hire you. And two, I'll always remember that if I need something done, I'll go looking for you, especially if it's something very important. So I think having that at the end where you think a little bit about the boss, you know, what do I need you to do in that department? And, and what could I use you in a leadership position that will get you to the next step too. You know, I love that. Um, we have a joke in my own medical school that uh, all the faculty think um, if only we would give them the pin number to the Dean's um, ATM machine, just give it to them they would be fine and uh because they could get the money themselves because that's what they're asking for and i i always counsel all my faculty and my mentees to say when you're speaking to your leaders say how can you help what can you offer how can you align you know i that was brilliant so thank you for sharing that dr freischleck um Dr. Templeton, when you're getting ready for a negotiation, how do you prepare for that? How do you think strategically to go into that negotiation? I think it's some soul searching on what it is that you want and need in the position. It's understanding where you envision the position going and therefore what resources you're going to need, not just now, but in the future and making sure that those are available. It's doing your research, it's doing your homework to find out what others in similar positions are being paid, whether at that institution or a similar institution. Mm -hmm. If you can talk with people in similar positions in other institutions um, and then practice. Again, women by and large aren't trained to negotiate. It's something where we often undervalue our worth and we feel guilty when we when we think we need or we should ask and we do ask for what we're worth and we always undersell ourselves. So I would also recommend practicing, practicing with friends, colleagues, people with whom you did your residency or fellowship. Do, don't just, you know, it just, it, you need some sort of rehearsal so that you feel comfortable with it because at least from my own experience, you may go in knowing what it is you're worth and what you want as soon as you start getting a little bit of pushback, then I start retreating. It's like, well, maybe I'm not worth that much. So it's it's envisioning what the negotiation is gonna look like. Practice with someone and practice really sticking to your guns in what it is that you want, but also understanding that the institution, especially with their current economy, may not be able to give you the, comp the financial compensation that you're looking for. So what are you willing to trade for that? So if you don't, if they are not able to afford this salary that you're looking for, well, then does that translate to more time off or more OR time? Or what is it that is valuable to you that maybe won't cost them additional money? Thank you. Uh, Dr. Thavisalan, you, you shared a really extensive list of items to consider in that whole composite of things beyond salary to negotiate, where did you 
acquire that list? Where does that list exist? Where do you get counsel over what of those things should you add to your list? How do you do that? Yeah, you know, I think you 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 start with, I think, your your mentors and your close colleagues to develop that list. I think you're then asking, you're then you're doing a little bit of research, including on the internet, including looking at business, including asking your colleagues outside of medicine and in the so-called real world, well, what does your contract negotiation process look like? Let me get a little bit of information outside this bubble. You know, that's where things like kind of termination practices or non-compete or like benefits, which all seem standard, but potentially have the ability to be individualized, I think come up. Um, and then I noticed another question in the chat about kind of soft influence skills. And I'd say that for me, again, thinking about the informal influence process, I think this starts with self-awareness. I know that I'm a conflict avoider uh, personally. I know that my, um, you know, response to negotiation is amygdala hijack. And I get that sympathetic discharge of tachycardia and kind of, as you say, wanting to retreat. Um, uh, and I know that's going to happen to me. And so I also know in that situation, I'm almost useless at, you know, conversing effectively and intelligently persuading. And, and so I think as part of my introversion, what I focus on is, is trying to listen intently and figure out, well, what is their style? If I know I'm an avoider, are they, you know, more of a competitor, like uh, it's my way, or not your way, it, you know, are they more of an accommodator? Let's split the difference here. Are they more of a avoider also, so that I can kind of really think about how am I going to present my asks to the person? So they're going to receive it in a way that meets where they're at. Um, and so Part of it, I think, is knowing yourself, what type of, uh, you know, what's your approach? And I say conflict because I think of negotiation as a conflict. Uh, I think you could take a better view of it and say, you know, it, it, it's a dance or a dialogue. Um, but I think that obviously shows you a little bit of my bias in terms of how I experience it or feel it. Um, and I think it's also occurring longitudinally. It's, it's not just one conversation. You know, I'm in negotiations over so many things with nursing staff, with leadership, with asking for, you know, increasing FTE for my service line. They're, and they're conversely in negotiation with me about all those, these kinds of things as well. So I think knowing yourself is where I start and then, uh, and then reading and preparing. So I think you lean on your mentors, but then you do your research. Mm. Dr. Fleisch. Fresh like how would you add to that? Yeah. Well, the first time I figured out how to negotiate was ELAM. So I took ELAM, you know, the second year, and I was getting ready to negotiate my division chief job at UCLA in vascular. And I sat with three or four women at ELAM and went through lists of what I needed. And it was a small division, you know, seven or eight people, but I ran an outpatient clinic, which was new to me. I had a donor, which was new to me. And I tell you, those other women really helped me figure out my negotiation skills as I went to get that job. And again, looking at um, what I needed to be successful as we went forward. Uh, Dr. Templeton mentioned a coach. And actually, when I showed up at UCLA, a coach walked into my office, Dick Kilberg, and said, you needed a coach. And you know, I was in the generation that there weren't any women's sports teams. So I was a swimmer. I thought, I, I don't play volleyball. And he goes, no, you need a coach. And so Dick spent a lot of time with me rehearsing, just like Dr. Palin said, he had me practice how to fire someone. He had me practice how to deal with a narcissist. He had me practice what kind of thing. And he was right. So if you do that practice, you'll know exactly what they'll say back to you. And so you actually can practice. Or if you get the answer you don't want, that you are able to say, okay, I hear what you say. I'll need to think about that a bit and see how important that is at the spectrum of what I need to be successful for you. Because actually, I'm here to be successful for you, not only for me to make that happen. So I've used coaches all throughout my career. I have I'm using one right now as you know, sort of transitioning into a new role. Um, we just partner with another big health system. So I'm trying to figure out how do you be a chief academic officer over six states? That's what I'm working on these days. Uh, so having someone that pays attention to that and can help you learn that is, is really important. I do think knowing yourself is really important. I'm a big extrovert, but I also um, tend not to go negotiate most for me I tend to go after what I need in the system to make it happen, assuming you're going to pay me well. And I tell you now, we're much better about that. But as far as perks and promotions and looking at that, it's, it's going to be a hard time the next few years getting salaries. We're all struggling about hiring anyone. I worry about our graduates this year. Are there going to be jobs? 
Are there going to be ORs that could be staffed so you could do something, you know, or do you have to go to an OR that's like five miles away in a barn because I can't put you in the main hospital anymore, you know, so we're all over the place. I, I moved all my urology down to Lexington. It's a small town 30 miles from us, and it's great. They have great big ORs, but they refuse to go till uh, COVID hit. Now they're filling that whole hospital up. The good news is they still have a a faculty lounge and they feed them lunch every day, but they have to drive 30 miles to do it and it's working out well. But I, I think it's going to be a little tough um, as you go forward. You really need to focus on what you're going to be able to do, maybe not this year or next year, but what does this look like in, in three to five years to make that happen? But coaching is really helpful. I, I've done it on and off all my time. It's it's an hour of your own life that you get to talk to them. You um, if you get involved with ELAM, you actually get a small group. And I know many of my women who have been in ELAM will call one of those people from their small group or a leadership group and have a great conversation with that. Because if you do talk to someone who just cares about your happiness and success and they don't have to pay for it, okay? So they're not, they don't have to pay you. They don't have to make it happen. Those kind of people are just priceless. And I do that a lot. I, I probably spend... Um, probably five to eight hours a month of uh, doing online or virtual mentoring of women surgeons across the country listening to their deal. And just recently, I had a young woman who um, didn't want to negotiate at all with a salary that was really 40% of what she should make. And they really needed her. So we sat there and practiced. She had come from there. They loved her. I said, so this is, you need to practice saying this number. This is the salary you have to have. So we practiced and practiced and, and she got it. So I think coming up with someone that can help you do that is really important to do it. Uh, but it is going to be a, a tough business right now. And I think um, a lot of it is going to be resting on what you think not only you could accomplish this year and next year, but what is your five-year plan with this job because it's going to take us um, three to five years to get to a place where I think we think we're in balance. So if if you will forgive me, I'm going to switch to first names because I feel like I know you so well. So I'm <laughs> going to add, um, <laughs> no, this is like a conversation. Julie, what you add so many le levels of amazing advocacy and sponsorship in what you just shared. I, I would ask you to articulate, how is it different advocating for yourself for in a negotiation versus advocating or negotiating for a mentee or a program or an institutional effort? I think it depends on your personality. And I think Simone said it well. You know, if, if you're someone who's just brash and brave, you know, negotiating for yourself and throwing numbers out there is fine. And I've seen that amongst all the men I've recruited as well, too. Um, that could be you. Um, frankly, I find it very easy to talk about the programs. There's a question about a fellowship program and all that. Oh my goodness, you can come up with why you would want a fellowship program, how it will make the institution more notable, how those people may stay and work with you, uh, how that they'll get, you'll do 30% you know, more work if you have a fellow. I mean, those kind of things I think are, are pretty easy to do. Um, I think the toughest thing I had to negotiate with um, was negotiating time off. Uh, Cause I came through in the eighties and nineties and that was just not negotiable. You know, I, I trained every other night in house. Um, people just took call, uh, you never stayed home. It was only when I got to Milwaukee when and, and even Hopkins where everybody came in every weekend even if they were on call or not. I mean, and we're talking early 2000s and, and it was crazy, you know cause it was all about uh, FaceTime and being there. And I think we've come a long way with that. But I think um, for me, it was being able to sign out to your partners, which now younger surgeons, um, it, it works much better. We have a great team that there's a doctor of the week and on weekends, unless you're in town and it's a patient you really know and you really did the case and you really feel like you need to be there, the sign off is just so much more amenable. Uh, to lifestyle now than it was 20 years ago. So I, I do think that um, those kind of things, you know, having partners that support you 
And then to me, it really matters who you work for. Uh, I, my boss, um, you know, what am I learning? You know, what am I contributing? But if I have a boss that I don't really appreciate how they think the world should be, that's not going to work with me. So really getting to know this boss in the negotiation to see, do they appreciate your lifestyle? Do they appreciate what you're bringing to the table? Can they hear you when you walk in and, and say, you know, I, I'm going through in vitro and there was a ruptured aneurysm last night I had to do, and I got two more sessions and it's cost me 10,000 a pop. The next one, I need you guys to take call. And this is what I had to do in the nineties. And he, he just looked at me like, now he thinks he's my kid's grandfather because, you know, he actually took calls so I could have this kid, but this was the nineties, <laughs> right? It, it was, it's not now, you know, it was like, you guys need to let me stay home and visualize to get this kid. And it had to be public knowledge to make it happen. So, so I do think, um, there, it's better now. Um, I think the other thing that's better now too, Nancy, is um, young men physicians uh, also see the need for work-life balance too. And some of us will argue perhaps a little too much, mm -hmm. uh, but they're partnered with very busy people, with their partners. They both are busy uh, uh, and they tend to go ahead and have four kids. Uh, but I've seen young men negotiate very hard for the softer skills and needs that they need as far as call schedules, uh, ability to take time off, coordination, jobs for their partner, uh, schools for their kids. Um, so there is a little difference going on now. And then also, uh, working from home, especially if you're hiring administrators and things, that there's a lot more out there that uh, creates flexibility. I think that's making it better for women when they come in requesting flexibility or something different. Tim, uh, adding on to that, so what if you're a woman who has come up through the field, your field, and um, never asked for anything? and just push through. What are the downsides of that woman not asking for something in the negotiation going forward? What are the downsides to the field, to the institution, to the department? Well, that's a great question because I think there are a lot of downsides and I am, I, I am embarrassed to see how little negotiation I, did in, in my first job because in a field that at that point was even more than the current 94% men, it, there were very, very few women. You, you were there right weren't there women too. to talk to, there weren't women to whom to get it from whom to get advice, and certainly the men wouldn't talk to you. So I had no idea that negotiation was a thing. Mm -hmm. I was just excited that somebody was going to give me a paycheck and a place to park so that I could do my job. Um, but but in hindsight, what you see some of the downsides is that, first of all, your salary starts off lower if you don't negotiate, which means that even if you go through, have salary increases, you never still quite catch up with the men. Um, if you don't negotiate for things such as operating room time, hard to generate the RVUs. And so when your salary is less than the men, they can always use that as an explanation for why not wanting to acknowledge the fact that unless you have access to patients in operating rooms, at least as a surgeon, it's really hard to generate RVUs, but then somehow it becomes our fault. Um, not negotiating for things such as, again, coaching or access to mentoring or sponsorship or what are the leadership opportunities. Negotiating for committee structure and when committees meet. Can you be on a committee, but can we alter maybe the time that the department committee meets so I can actually be there and participate in some of the decision making. And so unless you're engaged in that, you never, your career never really quite catches up. You can try, I'm trying, I'm trying to get caught up on all this, but if you don't start, you can catch up, but it's a lot more difficult than if you start early. Also, if you're negotiating for the things that you need for a new leadership position, as I mentioned at the beginning, if you don't negotiate for the things that you need to succeed as a leader, you're either going to get incredibly burned out trying to make it work, or you're not going to succeed and they're going to move on to someone else. 
not only is that a huge deterrent to your own career because you're, I think, going to be seen by other institutions as damaged goods because you had a leadership position and you couldn't cut it, even though it's not your fault because you didn't have the resources that you need. But also, I think it damages the, the, the future to some degree for women in leadership, because at least in my experience, if a leader fails, if it's a, if it's a, a woman, it's because women can't lead. And if it's a man, it's a personal failing. And so you may have a man who fails in a leadership position, frequently followed by another man. If you have a woman who fails in a leadership position, you're going to be really hard pressed to get another woman in a leader, either that leadership position or others. So I think it, by not negotiating, not getting what you need, it not only impacts your career, but it also impacts the careers of, of women who either your colleagues are coming up behind you in, in younger generations. Thank yeah, you. And how would you add to that? Yeah, you know, the, the question in this chat about how, what's a good way to start the conversation, I think, you know, I am, I, again, I said I'm a student, not an expert here. So, the, you know, the books that I have read, for example, I think Chris Voss's uh, Never Split the Difference is super useful here. Um, and he has kind of my two take homes from that book. Number one um, is tactical empathy. You know, when you're having conversations with people about asking for things, you're trying to get them to be kind of open to your influence so that they can solve a problem you have, you know, the, the art of them having, the, solving the, the issue that you have. And I think ultimately you're trying to get them into a space where you can have them say, that's right. You know, not you're right, but that's right. You understand me so that they can then be open to what you have to say, be it, this is how I'm going to make you money, or this is how I'm going to be successful in, in my position. And so, um, he uses the term tactical empathy, and I think it makes a lot of sense. You want people to be receptive to what you're asking for, so you have to get them into a place of saying you're right, which starts by listening to them. And then his you know, thesis is that you ask questions, and you ask questions to get more information, and you ask questions about how. Uh, you know, which is a very open-ended question. How do you think I would be successful here? How would this work? How would I be able to generate X, Y, and Z? What does it look like? And so you can get information from them on what uh, they think would work. So you can then start asking for that. So I think that that idea of asking questions, particularly open-ended, particularly the how and not why, so you don't come off accusatory, not who, what, where, so you're not a yes or no, um, but that that how uh, I think is super useful. And I think the other issue is you have to prepare yourself for no and not get triggered by no, uh, because then no, you kind of feel like, well, great, this is a flop. Let me go back to my, just give me the baseline. Uh, uh, I'm gonna show you how hard I can work and then I'm gonna earn it because this world is fair and meritocracy is a thing. But if we really don't believe that and we therefore have to be back and negotiating, then we have to prepare ourselves to accept no, but then literally reframe it in our heads, spit it out the other end and say, actually what they're telling me is, I'm not ready to, to say yes, I need more information. I need to go talk to someone else about this. I'm not quite sure, or you're making me uncomfortable. And so I think you have to read that out of them, figure out which one of those things it is, and then offer back some more information. And I think a lot of this happens through email, it happens through sideway chats in the hallways, it happens through some intermediary who he, he said, she said, you know, they said. Um, and I, I think this is like an, an active strategy game, if you will, that you're managing and, and you're playing. So. Um, I also find, found uh, Amy Gallo's book, uh, Dealing with Conflict, really useful. Uh, her framing of kind of thinking about problems in a depersonalized fashion is really useful for me. Again, I mentioned I'm an introvert and I get triggered by conflict. And so for me to have a very analytical approach to this conflict is not about personality or this tension is about, you know, production versus fairness. That helps me get out of, gosh, they don't like me or they don't kind of want to help me or they, they don't get my agenda. Um, and then uh, finally, I think Crucial Conversations by Patterson was also super useful. So in trying to prepare like that skill set to be able to have these conversations, they have this um, analogy of, of dialogue being adding to the shared pool of meaning, you know, and I think I get that concept of getting more information out on the table, no matter how you're getting it. So those I think are some of the strategies to start those conversations and then try and attempt to stay in them uh, when they get sticky and uncomfortable. Well, I think if you don't negotiate, you know, you're... I think you went on mute, Julie. You went on mute, Julie. And all of a sudden something happened there. You can see your name now. <laughs> so you're, no. you're not gonna like that job and you're gonna move on. And, and, and I've had lots of jobs. So there's a couple of them that I have moved on because it changed the leadership. and. If you are working with the search firm, they can be so helpful with this too. They can actually talk to you about the things you want. And the other thing that COVID-19 has done for us all, we do a lot of virtual interviews and first and second rounds now that you can put things 
on a document and send me a term sheet that I can actually look at and tell you, okay, this is good, this is good. You know, no, I can't buy your house. You know, I can't do that. Okay. So there's certain things I can do and certain not. So that actually puts it out on the table. Uh, but those, all those people can help you do that. But if you don't negotiate and don't feel like you can get there, um, I, I really do think uh, it, 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 you will change. And if it's not a leadership position, there were some questions about who do you ask? I mean, if you're coming to join a group and have a division chief, you know, really have good conversations with them to make that happen and make sure you understand what you need to be successful. And, and, and there are lots of things you can learn about that. And, and then you also, there needs to be a little bit of trust. I mean, so when you decide to come work for me, You've got to trust me a little bit that if something happens, like when I went to Hopkins and our transplant program blew up and I lost five transplant surgeons and lost $10 million in a year, I needed to trust that dean that he'd help me dig out of that because that was not the plan <laughs> So to do it. So you need to trust me a bit that as things go forward, if they're not working, and you may not know what you want. You may want to come and do a big research project and be a research person. I've had this happen. And after three years, you say, you know, I don't really want to do this. I want to be a clinician. And then so part of that is for me to say, okay, let's relook at that. Can we use you in that light? So a little bit of trust can be helpful. From your perspective, Julie, do you see, are there differences in how people from different uh, disciplines negotiate? Mm -hmm. And are any of the surgeons or surger surgery subspecialty experts at an advantage or disadvantage in that process? Yeah, that's a really good question because I've, I've hired about uh, 15 chairs, so all across the spectrum of what they do. And and some big time researchers, some big time clinicians, you know, other educators to do that. Um, by and large, um, over time, surgeons are listening more. When I first was negotiating with surgeons back in 2000 at Hopkins and hiring, I hired over 100 surgeons over 11 years. They didn't listen very well. You know, it would, uh, especially in the first five years, I had a lot of money. Then it was 2008, and not so much, right, to do it. And, and they didn't listen as well as what was there or not there. And, and I did have a margin. I, I was at Hopkins, a great place to do it. But I'm finding that the more we can get involved and you understand how the hospital works, how clinics work, how I don't have this big pot of money just sitting there, there are no margins, right, to do it. Where is philanthropy? What does this happen? The more you can understand that how I can support what you have and then what can you do to help me, whether it's clinics, uh, whether it's getting a research grant, whether it's a fundraiser to do that. I think I have found that if you can listen to me and I can listen to you and we can figure out what are the two or three things I really need you to accomplish as this new leader and what are the two or three things you really want so this works for you. If we can get those six things on the table, then maybe the other six are all we, we can think about. But if you can get those core things that you really feel good, that you're going to trust me to get you to that next level, I think that's been more helpful. Um, but nobody's, uh, I've had some very demanding pathologists, you know, I've had some <laughs> very loud pediatricians, you know, uh, so it, it's not necessarily, and I've hired, as you know, Nancy, half my chairs are women. And so I've hired lots of women. Uh, and, and partly is being able to trust me to have that conversation uh, that we're going to be fair. And then I also use outside um, uh, Sullivan and Cotter and others to make sure the salaries are right. We make mm. sure we benchmark everything. We know we're doing that well. We know we're putting it into a package. I've got three or four people looking at this. So this isn't a backroom deal. So you should be, they should be marked, they should be benchmarking all of this for you. So I, I guess the last, I, we were running out of time, but Kim and Simone, if you were preparing to negotiate with Julie, you're moving to her, well, potentially moving to her institution, what would you do to prepare for that? Where would you get your data from? Who would you enlist in the conversation? You know, I think this starts with a lot of self-reflection, maybe a list and journaling about what, where do I want to go with my career next? What are the skills that I've accomplished? 
some of the things I've learned in search committee positions for chairs um, is that people can take credit for the work that's happening underneath them effectively or not effectively. So I will often take credit for work I've completely owned. And if I haven't completely owned it, well, it's not my, my outcome to claim. And what I've seen in, in the process of reading through applications for chairs, for example, is that you can take credit for the work that you are involved in and speak of that outcome uh, and attribute it to yourself. Uh, much of it's very similar to kind of author attribution at the time of manuscript publication and the data suggesting that, you know, women are not going to claim their outcomes to be novel. Um, I think this is the same thing. So you look at your list of all of the accomplishments and the directorships and the leadership roles that you you have participated in, you look at those outcomes and you claim them. And so then you have this list of skills uh, that you're bringing to the table. Um, I think that's the place to start. And then access to MGM data and, and things like that. You know, I'm always on the internet Googling this stuff, looking for bootleg copies of all of it, uh, to be frank and honest that, you know, that's how I try and figure out where we're at. I also work at the VA where we have access to a, a government pay table. So I'd be looking at those ranges and, and trying to get some information on the ground. Um, that's how I would start. And then I think this idea of uh, uh, a run through so that you could prepare yourself and have that conversation and practice ahead of time, um, kind of so you could kind of practice that executive presence piece of it um, that I think is all part like sometimes of the performance, um, but so necessary. That's the piece that I would work on the most because I know that that, that feels to me like a, a weak link. I would thoroughly read the job description and what the expectations mm. are so that you can bring to the table, this is what you're looking for. These are the skills that I bring. This, these are some of my accomplishments in the past that demonstrate those skills. So based on the job description, I'm exactly what you're looking for. So now let's start mm -hmm. discussing not only what I can do to, for you to help fulfill the roles and responsibilities that you're looking for, but then what I need in return. So I would just make sure that when you're going in, you know exactly what that what Julie or any other negotiator is looking for in a position and make sure you highlight how much of a perfect fit you are for the job. So now let's start talking about how I'll be compensated for doing what it is that you say you need to have done. And the only other thing I would add is to call somebody I hired. Look at who I've just hired in leadership positions, send them an email, because they'll know we're looking at you and talk to them. See how I am treating them. See if I was honest to what I said. Yeah. See if they are happy being in my team. Uh, and, and that actually, I would just do that. Just especially if it's another woman leader in my institution in another woman chair position, um, call her and, and talk to her about how she's treated. We have, I think, one minute left. I see one question in the chat. How do you think our soft skills can be used as an advantage in negotiation? So our meaning, I think, women and our soft skills, how can we use that to our advantage? Yeah. I think you need to tell me stories similar to what Simone said of things you've done with teams and how you've worked with groups and how it's not about you. I just love hearing those stories about your students, your residents, your families, whatever it is. Tell me stories that when I remember you, I have a story, not just a CV. I think is a, and I completely agree with that. It helps, it helps emphasize what's on your CV. And I think also some of us are, excuse me, a little bit better at reading people. And so I think if you can or read where the, you're, the person with whom you're negotiating is going. See, see if they're starting to get uncomfortable. Maybe they're not used to having a woman ask for something and negotiate, so that's making them uncomfortable. That can either be to your advantage or not, depending on how they respond. But I would use that. I would use your ability to read the other person. And if things are going really well, great, keep pushing. If they're not, if someone's getting a little bit stressed out or uncomfortable about the situation, understand too how that may or may not impact the negotiation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this is the secret life of managing up. You're trying to figure out your, uh, you know, what level above the hierarchy, how do they work? So for me as a decision maker, I know that I need a lot of detail and structure of the full big picture to zero in my decision. So someone underneath me is coming to me with something 
it would behoove them to present with me with as much data as possible. Conversely, you know, I have a current um, boss ahead of me who's really more of a kind of a thinker. They're going to want uh, a lot of policy type uh, answers. I have another who's really just big picture, no details. They're not going to want 100 data points. They want three bullet points and no more. And so I know I need to keep a short brief in an email version, or they're going to ignore everything I have to say in a long prose setup. You know, if they're like a skeptic, the first thing you say, they're always going to be like, no, then I'm going to lead with something that's like oh, outlandish and then back off a little bit. And so I think reading who you're working with and figuring out, are, are they a thinker? Are they a skeptic? Are they really a controller? They, they want all the info uh, and then give it to them, package it the way they want it. You know, you start with packaging it the way you want it or you think of it, and then you have to reframe it for their their view. Yeah, I'm a three cents emailer. If you do more than three sentences, I don't read it. And if I answer okay, it means you did really great. If I write you three sentences, it means it didn't go so good. So part of it <laughs> is you know your boss. I actually tease that I say in five minutes I can see your soul, right? And, and and women are pretty good at that, you know, where you can sort of figure out who someone is and if you can manage that. Then when I see you on my schedule, I'm delighted to see you and can't wait to talk to you and give you what you want. I do see that there are other questions, but I do see that we're out of time. Well, my suggestion is that we collect those questions and maybe have our panelists respond um, by email and we can send those out collectively. They're excellent questions regarding preparation, doing your homework, navigating politics, navigating politics with women. <laughs> that could be a whole nother seminar. Um, I'm really um, grateful for all of your time. I know that there are a series of podcasts coming up uh, related to this webinar. And I wanna thank everybody from AUA and particularly Simone and all those who invited all of us to be part of this. So thank you so much for your time and have a great evening and we will be in touch. <laughs>